Hello, it's Anne Curry, and here's the second part of my talk, Knowing Too Much, Knowing Too Little, a comparison of Agincourt and Bosworth. In this part, I'm going to concentrate on sources and interpretations, and given my personal research interest in armies, I'll be saying something on those too, and on the vexed issue of just how many soldiers there were on each side. Of course, historians are only as good as their sources, and here lies the real contrast between the two battles. For Agincourt, there's a great deal of evidence, for Bosworth, very little. And this conclusion applies equally to the two main kinds of sources I'll be considering today. First of all, the chronicle or narrative sources, and secondly, the government or administrative records. First of all, then, the narratives of the battle. In the collection published by Boydell in 2000 as my Battle of Agincourt Sources and Interpretations, I was able to include 10 English narratives written within 50 years of the battle. Two of these were written within a couple of years of the Battle of Agincourt, and that's in addition to 14 French accounts within 50 years of 1415. And we can add to that literary sources from two-line jingles onto fully-blown ballads like those which we have for Bosworth too. Furthermore, we have as many as five eyewitness accounts of the Battle of Agincourt. The sheer abundance of chronicle narratives makes for difficulties of interpretation, hence my knowing too much where it comes to Agincourt. Now, you might be surprised by this and tell me simply to choose the best narrative. But how do we define best? Do we simply heap it all up into one narrative? And what when it's contradictory? These chronicle narratives were not intended as a record of actual events, but as records of what the events meant. The narratives are themselves interpretations and explanations. There are therefore English and French versions of Agincourt, religious and military versions, regional versions. Politicisation is there at every step especially between the rival political factions of the early 15th century, the Burgundians and the Armagnacs, with each side blaming the other for the failure at Agincourt. And so too is moralisation, that it's the sins of the French that means they're going to be defeated by the English. The effects of the passage of time are notable too, and of course all these accounts are written retrospectively. Academic historians spend much time considering battle narratives within the context within which they're written. And they bear in mind here that not everything a chronicler says is necessarily true. And let's not forget that the Tudors reinvented the Middle Ages, Agincourt included. The first English life of Henry V was written in 1513 to encourage Henry VIII to reopen war with France and to praise him for his marital fidelity. Little did the author suspect what was to come. The Italian Polydor Virgil's Andica Historia of the same period, composed under the encouragement of Henry VII in Latin and heavily influenced by humanism in the period, wasn't published till the 1530s. Edward Hall's Union of the Two Houses of Lancaster and York, written in the 1540s, a huge feat of imagination and a great read. It gives battle speeches not only to Henry V, but also to the French constable, where he reassures his men that the English will be a pushover, since once they're deprived of their roast beef and their warm beer and they're out of their beds, they'll be useless. Hollinshead's Histories of 1577 and in a second edition 1587, and finally, of course, the most enduring version, Shakespeare's play of 1599. Agincourt then has been constantly reinvented and is reinvented every time the play Henry V is performed. I suppose one could say the same about Bosworth's reinvention. Edward Hall invented the only direct speech battle orations known for Richard and for Henry Tudor, much as he'd ghostwritten speeches for Henry V and the Constable in 1415. Hall, Hollinshead and Shakespeare are exceptionally influential on modern popular views of Bosworth, which is dangerous. We should not be giving credence to accounts written 60 to 100 years after the event. So whilst for Agincourt we have a huge amount of contemporary chronicling, 
For Bosworth, we have very little. Let me illustrate this. Whilst I was able to fill over 400 pages of my Agincourt book with selected narratives from the 15th and 16th century, in Michael Bennett's book on Bosworth, he was able to get them all into 30 pages, and that includes some government records as well as chronicles. So why so little on Bosworth? Well, I refer you here to a comment I made in part one. Agincourt was part of a major international long-term war between England and France and a defining moment within that war, not least as that victory paved the way for the King of England to be accepted as King of France five years later. Bosworth was simply a battle of domestic conflict. Indeed, the chronicle narratives of other Wars of the Roses as a whole are generally sparse. It isn't simply Bosworth. Richard III's reign, too, of course, was very short. The Tudors won and established themselves in England for over a century. We have then no Ricardian accounts of or responses to the battle. Unlike Agincourt, Bosworth is a battle where the history is written solely by the victors. I don't think this is a case of suppression of information, but simply that the reign of Richard quickly became irrelevant, save in enhancing the reputation of the Tudors as God's chosen ones. Accounts of Bosworth written in England are very thin indeed. They're not well informed and they're writing in the new normal politics after the event. The continuation of the Crowland Chronicle, which is believed to be the earliest narrative account, customarily dated to 1486, is the longest of these early accounts, even though it is, in comparison with my Agincourt stuff, lamentably short. And the even shorter John Rouse's Historia de Regibus Angliae, dated to 1490, uh, along with passing references in the London and other Trown Chronicles of the period, hardly gives us anything at all. Bosworth attracted some interest overseas, perhaps because a king died in it. And also, of course, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, the Wars of the Roses saw quite a bit of continental in involvement, including, of course, a Bosworth with support from the French. A report, not really a chronicle, by Diego de Valera, Castilian, dated to 1486, is perhaps the closest we get to a Ricardian eye view, because it's based on comments by Salazar, a mercenary in Richard's company. But we also have the work of Philippe de Comines, a Franco Burgundian, written in 1490 or so, and of Jean Molinet, historiographer to the Burgundian court, dated to the same year, which is the only account, incidentally, that mentions guns, and which gives an account of Richard's death in the mud. All of these writers, of course, were writing after the event and were convinced that Richard had killed the princes in the tower and had faced divine judgment as a result. The longest early narrative of the battle is Polydore Virgil, Virgil's English History, a work, as I've said, patronised by Henry VII and likely composed within 20 years of the battle, but which not in the public domain till the mid-1530s. It was soon to be outstripped in length by Edward Hall in his work of the late 1540s, but in reality all Hall did was to add material to what was otherwise a paraphrase of Polydor Virgil's account. Hollinshead copied Hall almost verbatim, but of course there's one important thing that I mentioned in part one too, that Hollinshead added a personal gloss based on his local knowledge that between both armies was a great marsh, but at this present, by reason of ditches cast, it is grown to be firm ground. A lovely little addition, if you like, to what Hall had written already, and something that was key to our locating the site of the battle and all the archaeological work that then followed. What we lack like for Bosworth in contrast with Agincourt, are eyewitness accounts. Indeed, there's only one real claimant to a direct eyewitness account, although, as I've said, de Valera drew on the eyewitness testimony of Salazar. This true eyewitness is a letter written by one of the French soldiers in Henry Tudor's army. Annoyingly, the letter seems no longer to exist, but it was referred to in an article by the French scholar Alfred Spon in 1897. As Michael Jones has noted, this reference is problematic 
not least since the letter was dated at Chester on the 23rd of August, which of course is an impossible distance to travel in the time after the battle. Jones suggests that it could be a mistake for Leicester. You can almost hear the French soldier saying, these English place names sound all the same to me. But whatever the case, Spont only cites two sentences from this letter which are relevant to the battle. Richard came with all his battle, which was estimated at more than 15,000 men, crying, These French traitors are today the cause of our realm's ruin. In part, we then were the reason why the battle was won. An important point here, and I'll set aside the problem of numbers for the moment and the importance of those French soldiers, but let's now assess what we might call the military value of our chronicles. I mentioned in the first part of my talk that there was a tendency, true for both battles, for writers to deploy battle topoi. In other words, they had a notion of what a battle should be like and how to describe it. Particularly notable are omens, God's intervention. There's quite a lot of being wise after the event. Chroniclers were also snobs. They were interested only in the movers and shakers, the kings and their nobles. Sometimes you'd even think there were no rank and file involved in a battle. Richard III is praised by the chroniclers for his personal bravery, even though he loses. This too is a topos. We find it in the chronicle treatment of the Duke of Alençon, who was killed at Agincourt, trying to kill Henry V. Incidentally, that's uh, why, to understand the chronicles, you need to read a lot of them to spot patterns and traditions. And that's a hard ask, particularly for people not based in universities. That's not to say that Richard and the Duke of Alençon were not brave. Anyone in a hand-to-hand -hand fighting situation needed to be extremely courageous. It was a matter of going down fighting. These were men trained to fight from an early age. For Agincourt, we have the benefit of some chroniclers who understood military activity. And I'm thinking here particularly of the French writers Monstrelet and Warren, and also information from soldiers which was fed to the official chronicler of the crown, the monk of Saint-Denis. And so we get details of the lineup of the troops, who was in each battle. This word means something very specific. These are the divisions, usually three of them, into which the troops of an army were divided. Although I have to say there's still a dilemma on whether these battles just had one type of soldier in them, say the men-at-arms, or mixed retinues, i.e. men-at-arms and archers. The French men-at-arms at Agincourt in the first battle divided themselves into three groups in the advance and each of them was targeted at one of the English battles of men-at-arms and we see this clearly in these writers. We also see the way command and orders were implemented. For instance, Monstrelet and Warren tell us about Sir Thomas Erpingham throwing his baton in the air as the signal for the army to begin its forward move and for the arrow volleys to begin. In the Monk of Saint-Denis, we see the French sense of encirclement by the English archers and the impact of the arrow storm on the French advance. And all of these texts really tell us quite a lot about the French crowding in on each other as a response to the arrow storm. So close, the chroniclers tell us, that they could not even lift their weapon arms. And we hear in these and in other chronicles from both England and uh, France of the way that the French fell over and piled up on each other so that we get these heaps of bodies, uh, heaps of live bodies as well as dead bodies featuring in virtually every account and therefore I think we can say that's actually what happened and of course it, it, co it causes quite a lot of doubts to be cast on how much hand-to-hand -hand fighting actually happened at the Battle of Agincourt. Now there's still much we'd like to know and some phases are difficult to interpret uh, we know as well uh, the difficulty of translating from the languages, the French, medieval French and the Latin, of which these chronicles were written. The classic example is the Latin of the Gesta Henrici Quinti, the very early writing written by a priest who'd been on the campaign with Henry. <laughs> 
He tells us that the king drew up a single battle, placing his vanguard as a wing on the right and the rearguard as a wing on the left, and he positioned wedges of his archers in between each battle. And this has given rise to one of the great debates about Agincourt. Were the archers in the front, in front of the men-at-arms, or were they also on the flanks, or were they only on the flanks? There have been lots of difficulties in understanding the terminology here because the words that the author used were classical Latin words that didn't really fit very easily and comfortably into a 15th century context. But maybe in this dilemma it helps to know from the government records that I've looked at substantially that by the time of the battle Henry had about five times as many archers as men-at-arms and in that respect they probably had to be in the front and on the flanks as well. There was not otherwise enough space to accommodate them. The crowding and the piling up of bodies also suggests that the amount of hand-to-hand -hand fighting was limited save only on the English right where the Duke of York was in command, where the chronicle accounts of French success tally with the evidence of the financial records of casualties. His part of the army seems to suffer much more than any other part of the army. For instance, Lord Camoys, commanding the, the left side of the battle, loses no men at all at the battle, whereas the Duke of York is killed at the battle and a good proportion of his men die with him. Let's move on then to Bosworth. Like Agincourt, it was a planned event. The French choose the general, chose the general area where the battle was to be fought, but Henry V seems to have drawn his troops up first and was thereby able to exploit the lie of the land. Bosworth, the choice of the land was Richard's and he drew his troops up first. Both battles we have evidence of reconnoitring of the field, at least on the night before. Both seem to have the similarities of the threefold division into those battles. These are standard forms of deployment throughout the whole of the Middle Ages. At Agincourt, York was on the right, the king in the middle, and Camoy is on the left. At Bosworth, Norfolk was on the right, the king in the middle, and Northumberland on the left. Although with a possibility that Lord Stanley had been intended by Richard to form the left or rear guard of the army, but had held off and not come into that position. Henry Tudor's army is slightly different. It was certainly smaller. I'll say more on that in a minute. And I think there probably there were only two battles with the king to be in the middle, Tudor in the middle, and Oxford has to be really on the left because otherwise he's not going to be attacking the vanguard, the Norfolk vanguard on the right of Richard's army. It's a sort of mirror image, if you like, here. Now we can't tell from the chronicles for either battle, but I think it's likely that the three battles were not placed in a straight line. The right, the vanguard was standing forward and was usually the largest of the three battles intended to engage first. Hence, we find high mortality in the Duke of Norfolk's battle at Bosworth, just as there was in the Duke of York's at Agincourt. And also, note the comment of the Crowland continuation that Henry's vanguard under Oxford had both English and French troops. That's key. So it is the largest but it's also the most effective, the most professionally experienced part of the army. Can we plot phases within the battle? Well I think we can. The vanguard always engages first and the rear guard on the left may not need to engage at all depending on how things go. This is what I think happened at Agincourt. Now of course it's pretty awful if you're a soldier there just standing there waiting and watching what's going to happen and that's probably why Lord Camoys had been chosen to command that part of the army. is in his 60s and he's going to hold men firm where they see what is happening to their companions in the uh, vanguard and in the centre. And it's also relevant in the great debate about Bosworth where there are several comments that there was no fighting in Northumberland's battle, the rear guard. Now there are various ways of interpreting this. The first is that it was not needed, that the king had already been killed, 
and therefore there was no need for Northumberland to fight. He realised that uh, uh, the, the, his luck had uh, passed and it's of course very interesting that he was not treated harshly at all by Henry so perhaps he didn't play much of a role because he didn't need to. But there is also a possibility that he was in a position that he found very difficult to manoeuvre out of. It's been an idea put by Glenn Ford. Uh, or even, of course, that he turned his troops against Richard. And here we have the puzzling passage in de Valera's account on Tamerlant, Lord Tamerlant. The idea that this was part of Richard's army, but it turned against him. Although this would also fit with the idea of Lord Thomas Stanley, of course, intended to form the left or rear guard and holding off from the battle. I leave it to you to decide whether you think that Tamerlant is a, a, a way, a, a kind of Spanish way of trying to say Northumberland or trying to say Stanley. What then about the composition of the armies? The thinness of the narratives makes this less evident, but note that Polydor Virgil puts archers in front of the vanguard at both Agincourt and Bosworth. In fact, the wording he uses is virtually the same and under the command of the commander of the vanguard, the Duke of York or the Duke of Norfolk. It's a topos, perhaps, but it's also perhaps an indication of how archers were used as a first phase of a battle, a sort of softening up. Archers wouldn't have participated in close hand-to-hand -hand fighting. That was for the men-at-arms. And at Agincourt, we know that the archers only came in to the hand-to-hand -hand fighting when the French had piled up. And the archers then jumped on top of those piles and using their hammers uh, with which they'd hammered in their stakes or sticking daggers in the visor or the neck caused quite a lot of deaths there. And of course it's interesting that no arrowheads have been found at either site and that's why Towton archaeologically has been extremely interesting and important to us. It also explains the importance of the pike as a way of getting the lower ranking infantry into the melee alongside the men at arms and that is a real military revolution and so because we can be pretty certain that Henry Tudor had his French soldiers with pikes at the battle that really enhances the um, men at arms that that he's able to draw on who are smaller in number than those on the other side. What about guns then? Well intriguingly particularly in the light of the finds, they're only mentioned in Molinet's account. Richard had a great number of cannons, Molinet says. He had them fire on the Earl of Richmond. This led the French to mass their troops against the flank rather than the front of Richard's battle. Now this is a great shortcoming of the guns. Guns were in fixed positions and it was impossible to move them, but it was possible to move your men out of the way. We still don't know whether Tudor had guns. I suspect that he had managed to pick some up en route if he'd not even brought some with him from France. Both battles see the use of natural features, the woodland at Agincourt to protect the flanks, the marsh at Bosworth, a movement by the Earl of Oxford to skirt the marsh to develop new positions and to regroup. Oxford famously calls his men back to the standard. They regroup. Battles then are extremely dynamic events. Now there are similarities of course in that both are fought on foot. But I think Bosworth is a much more mobile battle. We've seen the movement to avoid the cannon fire but at Agincourt there was also the French failure to override the archers in the first phase of the battle. Indeed I think the arrows put off anybody getting on a horse. Horses were very vulnerable to arrows. At Bosworth we find references in Polydor Virgil to Richard's line of foot and mounted and Henry's forces described in the same way with Gilbert Talbot and John Savage commanding mounted wings. It seems the commanders and their own households remained mounted and the key moment of the battle perhaps is Richard's mounted charge against Henry. They obviously wanted to kill each other. Now that's a contrast with Agincourt, but the French at Agincourt would have wanted to capture Henry V, not to kill him. For both battles, the political dimension is very important. And here we are in areas that are not strictly military, but which concern loyalty and commitment.
At Agincourt, was it the Burgundians and the Armagnacs to blame? Did the French 3rd Division engage at all? The folly of the young commanders, the lack of regard for troops who were not men-at-arms. And in Bosworth, the same kind of thing. The Earl of Northumberland doing nothing, but also defections and lack of commitment, which is very prominent in the narratives. I think this takes us to an important question about Bosworth and indeed about Agincourt, did all men fight? It's a crucial element because it casts doubt on the importance of numbers. It doesn't matter how many men you have in your army if they don't all engage. Both battles were quite short. Indeed, Agincourt, in one chronicle text, 30 minutes. Bosworth, a little more than two hours. But as I've said, once Richard was dead, there was no need to fight on. And I think there's an interesting thing we can draw from Polydor Virgil's account of Bosworth, and that is to do with mortality rates. Just note that he has a thousand dying on Richard's side and a hundred on Henry's. Now, I'm not saying those numbers are true, but he's giving a rough idea of the difference in scale of losses. But contrast those figures, a thousand and a hundred, with what he has for the Battle of Stoke. Four thousand dead. And for Towton, 12,000 dead. In Polydor Virgil's mind then, Bosworth was a lesser battle. Let's move on then to the problem of sizes, which leads me into discussion of what we can know about the armies. Can we believe the chronicles? No, there is no way Richard had 60,000 at Bosworth. Chronicles always exaggerated, partly for effect, partly because people had a different concept of numbers from us today. Numbers are a language all of their own. Chronicle narratives of peasant revolt, for instance, have more Kentish peasants marching on London than the whole population of the county. Some Agincourt narratives give the French as big an army as in the Napoleonic Wars. Quite a lot's been said about the Crowland continuation telling us that at Leicester there was a greater number of fighting men than had ever been seen before on one side in England. And people have used that to say Richard had a huge army. But beware, you need to read the whole text of the Crowland continuation which kicks off in 1459 and you'll see there how the chronicler was prone to a big, bigger, biggest approach. It might also be a feeble attempt at satire that Richard did not have a big army at Leicester. Note also that the same chronicler tells us that with Tudor advancing towards the Midlands, Richard at Nottingham had previously felt it necessary to move the army, though its numbers were not yet fully made up. Richard was worried not all the troops had come. Is there a way then of getting round the problem of knowing how many men there were? Remember, there was no standing army either in 1415 or in 1485. But for Agincourt, we have a lot more material we can use because this is a paid army. Armies were raised by contracts in captains indented to bring a certain number and type of troops for a certain period of time, 12 months in 1415. All troops were paid and mustered to prove that the contract terms had been fulfilled. And as a result, we have a vast amount of archival material in the Exchequer records in the National Archives, which I used to calculate my numbers, boosted by muster rolls, which actually give the names. And that's why I came up with 12,000 at the, uh, the time that the uh, expedition set up, sick lists, up to 2,000 men, the garrison of Harfleur, 1,200, and then the rest have got to be at the battle. So anywhere between eight to 9,000 uh, at the battle. The French army, by the way, had the same kind of recruitment model and financial records. It's just that fewer have survived. But we do have musters for the French army in this period. The tax that had been levied envisaged an army of 9,000. And even if we add in more later, it can't really be more than about 12,000, particularly given the real political problems of the day. And note that whilst everybody emphasises one or two chronicles here, there are some French chroniclers that actually give the English more men than the English in the battle. What about Bosworth? Well, it's more difficult 
But there are similarities in the way the armies were created, even though the Bosworth armies were not, or the Richard's army was not paid. They were there to defend the king and his kingdom. Richard's own household, like Henry's, would have been the core of the army. Every man in his household would have brought troops. He'd appointed 50 knights of the household, 108 uh, squires and 138 yeomen. 296 men so they would have been expected at least to bring a few men each or themselves if nobody else. He'd also given 150 grants of lands as patronage and maybe some of those people he would have been expecting to to come to his aid because he issued summons letters and he sent these also through the nobility that he considered loyal. But there is a big problem of the attendance of peers at the Battle of, of Bosworth. In fact relatively fewer there and they always had the largest retinues therefore if they hadn't come you can see this on the slide here then Richard would be denuded of men there was a big timing problem too Henry had landed at Milford Haven on the 7th of August Richard was at Bestwood Lodge near Nottingham he got news of the landing on the 11th of August and he sent out letters immediately and these letters are the same as we see for other battles of the Wars of the Roses one which survives relates to Henry Vernon of Haddon and uh, uh, Haddon Derbyshire, a former retainer of George, Duke of Clarence, now a squire of the body of the king, was told to come with such number as ye have promised, sufficiently horsed and harnessed. This to be done in all haste, no excuses permitted upon pain of forfeiture. It doesn't seem as though he came. In fact, he hadn't turned up in 1471 when he'd been issued with a summons like that. And at the end of the day, we don't know how many letters were sent, whether the recipients chose to respond or if they did, whether they managed to join the king in time or not. Many wouldn't have been able to get to Leicester in time, especially if the battle was anticipated to be closer to Nottingham, as a reference in the Nottingham town record suggests. The king may only have sent letters then to those within a suitable distance. One doubts also whether he had enough messengers to send many, mes many such messages out. The state of government was not at all certain. The last entry on the patent rolls was the 9th of August. Did Richard even have an adequate chancery with him in Nottingham and then Leicester? But clearly the Duke of Norfolk did respond. Uh, he was written to probably on the 11th and received the King's request by the 14th. In his own archives we have a list dated the 26th of February 1484 giving details of a thousand men that my Lord, i.e. Norfolk, had granted the King. And it shows that Richard was anticipating invasions and challenges. Some of these thousand were the Duke's household servants. Incidentally, there aren't a thousand names in the list anyway. But the majority were his tenants listed under the Duke's lordships to be ready at all times at my lord's pleasure. In addition, there were 50 men who were to bring two or three others at Howard's cost. These were estate officers, councillors and others, auditor, secretary. But there were no East Anglian gentry here, retainers or friends. We know that the, uh, the, the Duke's son uh, came along and we even have a will of one of his soldiers, Thomas Long of Ashwellthorpe. What size of retinues then could these sorts of people bring? Well, as I've said, the peers always brought the most. So in the 1475 invasion of uh, France, Richard, then Duke of Gloucester, served with 10 knights, 100 men-at-arms and 1,000 archers. Northumberland, the Earl of Northumberland on that occasion, by contrast, brought 410 men. So could he really have brought more in 1485? What about the knights? Well, Sir Henry Vernon in 1471 had been asked by the Duke of Clarence to bring 20, but we know he didn't come. But a 20 strong retinue for a knight was pretty common. For a squires, it's always below that number, and often they're penny numbers, two or three men. There were a few mercenaries there and potentially Richard called out urban troops. We know of this in the case of York and Exeter, but it really is difficult to know whether any of those troops got there. And it doesn't seem as though Richard called out commissions of array. In fact, it's likely that once it was realised French professionals were in Henry's army, and there was plenty of spying going on, the idea of having the Shire levies raised was, was dismissed. Such men would have been complete cannon fodder, if you'll excuse the term, against Henry's professional army. Or else they were kept, of course, for local defence, because Richard couldn't be too sure what was going to happen.
What about Henry Tudor then? Well, he brought troops from France. The exiles with him were about a thousand, perhaps even more than that strong. And this is interesting because after the battle, he starts to set up the Yeoman of the Guard. And we see in those quite a few grants for people who had been with him overseas and are now given special rewards. We think there were some Scottish troops with Henry as well um, that had come to assist, perhaps even up to a thousand men already in service in France. And then the French mercenaries. Well, we know that Henry had spent about 40,000 livres tournois on this, perhaps up to about 2,000 men, not just the Francachers, but also the pikemen. And as he walked through, as he marched through Wales and England, he used the same means of summons as Richard by sending out those letters in his name as king. Here's one that he sent from Mahinlich on the 14th of August to Sir Roger Kynaston of Shropshire, who was also constable of Harlech Castle. We will and pray you and upon your allegiance straightly charge and command you that in all haste possible ye assemble his said folks. This is very, very similar to what had been sent to Henry Vernon. Bring your people, your servants, and with them, so assembled and defensively arrayed for war, you come to us for our aid and assistance. So there were two kings, essentially, operating in England in the run-up to the battle. And we have another letter sent to John Ap Meredith Ap Hugh and Ap Meredith of South Carnarvonshire. We desire and pray you and upon your allegiance straightly charge and command you that immediately on the sight hereof, with all such power as ye may make defensively arrayed for the war, you address you towards us without any trying upon the war, and to such time as ye be with us, wheresoever we shall be, to our aid for the effect above rehearsed, will cause us to be in time your good lord. Fail not to avoid our displeasure. Troops were raised in Wales. Rhys Ap Thomas, for instance, well, he could bring quite a substantial number of men. We know that for the 1492 invasion of France, he brought 590 men. What about Stanley? Well, Thomas Stanley brought 40 men-at-arms and 300 archers on the 1475 expedition, and his brother, William, brought 23 men. It's always the peers then that can bring the most, but perhaps they could have recruited more locally. However, it was not likely to be on a scale that is often being claimed, and it's really difficult to know whether Thomas participated at all. In fact, Polydor Virgil even said that Thomas reported that he'd wait until the Earl of Richmond has drawn his troops off, i.e. he probably held off throughout the whole time, keeping up a pretense to both sides. Though we know his brother William Stanley participated, coming to the support of Henry Tudor, and potentially crucial then in the death of Richard, after Richard had launched that attack on Henry. And note, of course, the pre-battle meetings of Henry with the Stanleys. We know, too, that there were defections to Henry when he was at Tamworth, and I think he was likely to get support in the Midlands for the erstwhile supporters of Lord Hastings that Richard had executed in 1483. So what conclusions then can we come to in all of this? I think Henry had about 5,000 men. That's the figure given in Polydor Virgil too. And Richard had between seven and 8,000 men. And this links to calculations of the size of the front made by Glenn Ford. He sees Richard's front as 1,100 metres. If we use the Vegetian spacing of 0.9 metres per man and the men stood six deep, that would give us for Richard a total of 7,220 troops, remarkably close to the figure I've come to by looking at the administrative records. But important in all of this are the foreign troops under Henry. There's no problem with their loyalty, whereas Richard had problems, and perhaps even during the battle, but certainly defections before it. If Richard had any militia-style troops from the towns or countryside, they would not have been at all effective against professional soldiers. The Wars of the Roses also shows that kings didn't have the upper hand. They depended on the nobility for troops. That's how, campaign, that's how armies for international campaigns were raised, and it's also what happened in civil wars. If by the sword divided was a problem, was Richard a popular king amongst the nobility? I think on the whole, 
we have to say no. But at the end of the day, it's all down to what happens. The French reluctance to join the cavalry in 1415 to override the archers meant that the archers were there still to do their worst. Richard's impetuousness in wanting to, to solve a problem, maybe seeing that Norfolk had uh, been, been suffering under the attack from Oxford. Is it Richard's impetuousness or is it bravery? Well, I'll leave you that, uh, leave it for you to decide on that. The uncertainty of soldiers when they see action turning against them, and that was pretty obvious in the Battle of Bosworth. Finally, both battles have suffered from what we want them to be. The battles are as we imagine them, not necessarily the battles fought. We have a big problem then with the ballads, which I think date to the early 17th century and are part of this mythology of battles. It's a huge problem both with Agincourt and with Bosworth. Battles gain a certain social capital, which can lead to counterfactual elements. The idea of ancestors fighting there, leading to false coats of arms being created. The idea that Brandon at uh, Bosworth lost his helmet and seized a, a cow skull, uh, hence the horns appearing, and uh, the various other similar kinds of legends giving rise to coats of arms for these families that claimed links to Agincourt. What is the way forward then? Well, I think it isn't really through the chronicle sources, it is through the government records. More work too on professional soldiers, on weaponry, and of course more archaeology and more understanding perhaps of numbers that were feasible and that's very important to set in the context of logistics, the feeding of an army in the field, the watering of men and their horses and also understanding the numbers within a landscape, the sorts of calculations that Glenn did on the front based on the, the findings of the research project against the material we have from the administrative records. There is a long way to go and I think we're all committed really to taking all of this forward and certainly comparative study of battles, particularly the battles of the Wars of the Roses, is also an extremely valuable way of proceeding. Well, thanks for listening. I'm very happy to take up any points. Please email me on a.e.curry at soton.ac. UK. And if you're not already a member of the Battlefield Trust, I think it's time you were. Bye-bye.